Hello again, it's Tim uh, Linnerman back with another video lecture for the online critical reasoning course. Um, this is the first video, uh, first video part uh, in another series of videos for um, the module building blocks of arguments. Um, so I'm going to, I think I'm going to start trying to split these up into like about hour long segments so it's not like a big huge video you watch all at once but you can like you can break it up into little segments and then I think I I think I'm gonna stick with the sort of having one code for the the whole series and then just adjust the points for it based on how many hours of video uh, ends up getting made and you having to watch um, but I am gonna continue to shoot for a, around It'll probably be at the minimum level. It'd be three hours for each module. Maximum might be closer to five, um, something like that. But I'm gonna try to keep it short and sweet, and um, and not make you watch too many hours of me yapping at you. Um, <clears throat> on this one, uh, mm, one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, so far in the class, I haven't had a ton of students getting in contact with me. Um, to ask questions or to get advice or go over answers or things like that um, and maybe that's also because we're, we're still kind of just working through um, the first big module if you're on the um, recommended schedule <clears throat> you are um, maybe uh, working toward finishing the uh, language module at the moment that I'm recording this this is uh, let's see this is uh, September 29th uh, the, the Thursday. So this is, I'm recording this in the middle of um, you working on that first module and maybe you're just finishing up your homework right now but I just wanted to repeat that again that I'm here um, for you to get, help you get more out of the class. Um, you're not left to your own devices in trying to just suss out what's happening um, in the exercises and what the homework is asking for. Um, I'm here to help you with that and the lectures are here as a supplement but sometimes you want that one-on-one -on -one feedback sometimes you want the more personalized help in my experience this of all the classes that I teach this is the one that um, has the greatest need for that and there's a greatest potential benefit too. so much of informal reasoning uh, informal logic is a matter of making judgment calls and um, everyone kind of comes at the, that these analytic projects from a different direction and may have certain things that are um, they, they have their, you have your strengths and your weaknesses in different places and helping you to navigate that and the idiosyncrasies of what you bring to the table is is something I'm here for and I can be that kind of um, like uh, advisor or what's that like tutor I can be like a I, I'm ha so happy serving like that um, for anyone who wants it, just just call me up, uh, send me texts, email, whatever you want. I can do a Google Hangout um, to talk to you too. So uh, there's a lot of ways to get access to me, and and, and I hope you do. Okay, so for um, this next module, so I just love to um, kind of let you know what we're going to be doing, what we're about to be doing. I've got the more exercises here. I thought I'd do like a little um, tour because some people were asking some questions about how to go about doing the homework on these modules and, and you've got a few documents that uh, you have access to for every single module. There's always going to be this document that gives you the instructions. Um, sometimes it'll I'll tell you if there's some extra reading like in this module there is a little extra reading that I'd like you to do. I want you to check out this little section on validity. It shows up from chapter 8. Um, and that's going to be really helpful for understanding what's going on in chapter three, which doesn't go in as much technical detail. But I'll, I'll be talking about it in this lecture too, so that'll help. But I, I'd like you to read that. And then um, I want to remind you that I'm always um, in this document. There's always the chance that I might ask you to uh, modify the instructions as you would see the exercises in the in the textbook. So these are scans here of what uh, the exercises that I've assigned are taken from the textbook. Um, and sometimes I'll mess around with the instructions for them. So, um, or maybe give you some tips. Or like I'm saying, exercise two: don't don't spend so much time trying to uh, analyze and deconstruct those things. Um, that's not there's you're not going to get as much bang for your buck there. Um, but I do tell you to um, put extra attention here on exercise seven. Very important because this is what's going to look like on the exam. And the same thing for the exercise three that we're throwing in from chapter four. 
I'm not having you read chapter four. Uh, you don't have to do that. Um, but I did want to pull this exercise for some extra practice because um, exercise seven, nine, and three here from chapter four are going to be sort of showing, they're going to be asking you to do basically what I'm going to be asking you to do on the exam. Uh, for, for the material that's coming from this chapter 3 section. So this instruction sheet will, will is very important to use as a supplement when you're doing the homework and looking at the exercises that are in the homework. And I don't assign all the exercises. We'll skip, I skip around a bunch usually. Um, sometimes I'll even tell you you'll do only a few problems from a certain exercise. So keep that in mind. Um, there, it sounds like there's some confusion about that, so I just want to clear, clear that up. Um, but what are we going to be doing here? Let's actually, um, let's go here to, this is from the, uh, yeah, gonna, this is from the chapter four, exercise three. It's, it looks like this. Um, and it's asking you to um, basically annotate a passage um, of argumentative prose. So where someone is writing or speaking and they're, they're arguing is, is something that's going on here. We might say, it, I mean, Arguing, it's a doing, and it's something we do with language. So we could call arguing a speech act. It's definitely a speech act. Sometimes it might not be explicit that what the person is doing is arguing, but you may pick up on that implicitly. And so arguing could also be a conversational act if, if it's an implied doing, too. Um, so that to kind of connect it in with the stuff we were doing from Chapter 2. I love, love making connections, drawing it all together. Um, so the, that, that's a way to think about it there. And, and that's what we're going to be kind of exploring in this module. We're going to start actually talking about arguments and how they're constructed and what goes on with them and what are the different maneuvers that you make with arguments. Um, and I'm going to refer to that this project of tracking the speech and conversational acts that we do as a part of arguing as this annotation activity where you'll get a passage of argumentative prose and you'll have to pick out all of the different uh, things that are happening in it. Now in the exercise they highlight things and they're like what does poor mean? Maybe nothing. But which of the things that we're going to be talking about in this lecture is happening in this example right here? You're supposed to identify if there is something or not. On the exam I won't be numbering them. So it won't be exactly the same. Instead it's like if I gave you this paragraph it wouldn't be this long. but if I gave you a paragraph uh, and put out all the numbers and, itali and, and took out the italicized stuff and just told you, go looking for all those things, that's what the exam is going to be like. So that's, that's kind of, as I'm talking through all the material and we're talking about all these different things, um, we'll be picking out the stuff I want you to be annotating for. So the, the sort of maneuvers, the, the tactics, the maneuvers, that the activities that are part of the activity of arguing, I want you to be able to listen for them. And here's, here's a major tip as we're going into it. Um, it's very easy, in my experience teaching this material, it's very easy for students to want to make like a list of vocabulary or phrases that count as doing this activity. And then they go looking for those words and phrases and label them. So it's this kind of like um, mechanical way of trying to identify all these different maneuvers and activities that are a part of arguing. I would strongly discouraging, I discourage that method. I will be looking at examples. There's some lists in the book. The book gives lists to try to give you a pretty good list of examples for what this, what could count as this phenomenon. But in my experience, like mastering this material is a matter of first understanding what it means to do this activity. And it's not always completely clear. <clears throat> or some of them are a little complicated, and that's what my lecture is here to help explain, and the book gives descriptions of them. But to know really what is in principle happening with these different maneuvers, and to be able to listen for those things happening, and then go looking for the language that's responsible for doing that thing and circling it and annotating it. That's going to that's gonna be the game here. So instead of getting really fixated on the English language and the words and phrases, you want to be instead listening to the ideas, listening for the concepts of what's taking place, not the words. Then this is, I think I, I brought this up before, um, as like you're going to hear me say this a lot at various times in the class, and a lot of the analysis that we're trying to do is not an analysis of English. It's not a linguistic analysis. I mean, we were just learning some ling language analysis, but that was to be able to like 
kind of bracket it away so we don't get distracted by the words too much. Now we're going to be focusing on the ideas. We want to be focusing on the concepts. And I, I, to be fair, I mean, that's why we wanted to learn conversational implication so that we can listen more deeply to the concepts that are behind the words and not get too distracted by taking words literally. I've met many um, people who fashion themselves to be great critical thinkers, but they miss out on a lot of stuff because they're just taking everything literally and and um, being kind of lawyerish about how we speak with each other, and that's not true critical reasoning. Um, there's a really famous philosopher, contemporary philosopher named uh, David Lewis, who died, I think, in the last, definitely in the last ten years, maybe in the last five. I think his death was kind of recent, um, but he was a very famous contemporary philosopher, and he wrote, uh, and he wrote on very abstruse topics, like stuff that nobody thinks about. Not your like, like the person on the streets, not like, huh, I wonder about the metaphysics of counterfactual possible worlds and stuff. That's what he was really into. He was all into thinking about possible worlds and counterfactual claims and and parsing out the logical construction of actually some of the things that we'll be studying in this class. I think I'll bring in some David Lewis to help with the lectures a little bit later for some of the stuff we'll do, but not for many weeks. But anyway, he does really abstruse philosophy, but he wrote this awesome paper, an informal paper, where he was just kind of commenting on what he was observing about how people were doing professional philosophy, and he had kind of a complaint about how a lot of times philosophers, um, they, they talk about the intuitions that people have or how people generally think but they're not listening very closely to people who are not philosophers who know how to who have learned or mastered this kind of very um, careful and precise way of articulating ideas and concepts with a huge vocabulary and technical language and blah 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 but for the people that are just kind of speaking more casually um, that these philosophers don't like listen very carefully to what they're actually saying and instead just take their words literally and then totally misunderstand what's happening. And he's like, I think a lot of times philosophers in talking about what's intuitive and what's not intuitive or what people are thinking or what they're not thinking, they get it wrong. They, they miss where people are actually at because they're, they're interpreting too literally. So all the stuff we did with implication in the last unit, in the chapter two uh, module, the, the language of arguments, that's really helpful for us now. Even though we're not going to be focusing more on linguistic analysis, by having that under our belt, it's actually going to make it easier for us to listen to the ideas and not get distracted by the words. And so that's that's going to be a major theme here. Definitely, definitely recommend it. Number one thing you can do to help yourself with this material is to make sure you've got a strong grasp on the phenomenon that we're listening for and then be able to hear, just pick up when that thing's happening, and then go looking for the language, rather than scanning the language, oh, that is that word, so I'm going to mark it, this thing, burp, burp, burp. don't do that that way, do the listening. That, and if you want some more help on how to calibrate your ear to listen for those things, I, in the lecture I'm going to be kind of explaining these things, trying to give you some of that advice, but uh, if you want to touch base um, with me more, if there's certain, th this is, these these kinds of listening uh, skills that are part of uh, an informal analysis of, of arguments uh, is one of those things I think about as uh, one of these calibration issues where talking with someone like me on a one-on-one -on -one basis can be really helpful. So look me up. Okay, don't don't be shy. I'm I'm here right now. i you know even with the child and everything, I still got time and I have room. And it's not like students have been knocking down my electronic internet door so much that I can't handle it. So. So let me know how I can help you. Okay, so everything that we're going to be doing in this unit and in these lectures will be um, attempting to uh, identify some of these major things that we can do as a part of arguing. So arguing is a pretty big activity. It's got a lot of sub-actions that are a part of it. Like we were talking about speech acts like um, uh, speech acts in baseball. If you took the baseball game, a lot of different activities taking place to play baseball. So you want to say, well, what are you doing? Playing baseball. Well, that's kind of, that integrates a lot of, there's a lot of other activities. Throwing, hitting, running, all sorts of catching, all sorts of things happen in baseball. Same thing with arguing. When we're arguing, there's something that's going on there, arguing, but it's composed of a lot of other activities too. 
But there's one basic there's one basic thing that has to do with arguing, or that is that we could define as the activity of arguing. That then there are these just different varieties of, and that is um, the definition that we talked about in the last lecture about um, arguing an uh, in argument. So arguing would be constructing arguments. If we're thinking about this more narrow sense, constructing arguments. And what are arguments? Arguments are claims that are supported by at least one other claim. If you've got a claim supported by at least one other claim, you have an argument. That's the object of an, argue, an argument. So if you're arguing, what are you doing? Well, you're supporting a claim with other claims. So you're offering a reason, or you're trying to justify, or defend, um, provide the evidence that um, gives us good reason to believe that a conclusion is true. That's what that's what we could think of as like the basic activity of arguing. But to do that, there's a lot of other things we'll do at the same time. But that's what we're going to pick up here. So this first thing that we're going to be wanting to list, to be listening for and then to annotate in a, a passage of argumentative prose is to recognize when are arguments happening and when are they not happening. In this, with this, with regard to this particular annotation, uh, English gives us a lot of help. Um, here, let's let me pull up my lecture notes. We have these things called argument markers that make it explicit that what we are doing is making an argument. So if someone uses these words, like these conclusion markers or these reason markers, then what they would be doing as a speech act is arguing. So remember, a speech act is, is um, something that's transparent, doesn't require sneaky interpretation, getting into conversational implication. It's like, if you said those things, you're doing that thing. So when people are using this kind of language, there are a couple exception cases here. These words are not always argument markers, but for the most part, if you say blah, 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 therefore blah, 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 you are performing the speech act of arguing. Um, that's what these words in English are for, is to um, let us know that an argument is taking place. Um, saying blah, 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 therefore blah, 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 is telling the audience I'm advancing this claim on the basis of this other claim. So that, that makes it an argument. So there are some exceptions to this. So um, like since can be a temporal marker. It doesn't have to be an argument marker. Um, it could be like since I turned 21, my life has been much better or worse. I don't know, something like that. That wouldn't be saying because I turned 21, life became worse. It's just since the time at which I turned 21, you know, life has gotten better or worse, something like that. One big thing to note here um, that's a tip that I always want to tell students is um, they want to, students usually want to look at these words and try to figure out how they, um, how they reference what other words are going on. And it's really not that complicated as you might want to make it. All that it means to call something a conclusion marker is that whatever follows that argument marker is going to be the conclusion. And what it, the only thing that makes a reason marker what it is, is that whatever follows the reason marker is a reason or a premise for something else as the conclusion. So I'm going to have a, this little silly whiteboard. I'm going to do some drawing. Let's say blah, 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 and then, and then some blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. Pardon my terrible internet drawing. I wish I had a light pen, that'd be super sweet, but I don't. So if I say blah, 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 because, or blah, 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 therefore, blah, blah, blah. So these, these are, I make some blah, 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 because blah, blah, blah. All you got to do, if you're trying to figure out what, okay, you might be like, okay, I know that these are argument markers. They let me know that there's an arguing happen, an argument happening. There's a support relation that's being established between a bunch of claims. Remember again, we were talking about um, standard form. Or maybe we weren't. Uh, maybe I haven't presented standard form yet. I think I'm confusing you with my other classes I'm teaching. So there's this thing. We'll be talking about this a little bit more in the lecture. But there's a thing called standard form um, in which we put. Uh, I'm not going to use this. I'm not going to try to draw letters. That's silly. Sorry for these really terrible pictures, but hopefully you get the idea. And then you could have... Hmm? Nope, stop it. There we go. 
Um, there could be more. You, know, prem you can have an argument with only one premise, but this this kind of way of diagramming things is uh, what we call standard form. So you got a bunch of claims in an argument. Some of them are supporting one other claim. At, so the con conclusion claim is the claim receiving the support. Premises are the claims that give support to the conclusion. So there's this support relation. It's an asymmetrical relationship. Um, it's it does, this isn't a two-way street. Um, the premises, if true, are supposed to give a reason for the conclusion being true. That's an argument. This little triforce symbol, three dots like this in a triangle, um, just means therefore, which is an argument marker. But if you've got an argument, then you've got this support relation. You've got claims supporting another claim. If you were able to figure out, oh, because, therefore, I can tell you know, you're, from your ear listening, you can be like, oh, I know there's an argument because there's a support relation taking place here between claims. You still need to be able to tell me whether something is a premise or um, reason marker or whether it's a conclusion marker. And the trick is really simple. When you're listening, it's blah, 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 because, blah, 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 or blah, 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 therefore, blah, blah, blah. Figure out, is this claim over here, is this a premise or a conclusion? So when someone says blah, 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 because blah, 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 they're giving this as the reason for why this is true. So if this is the reason, if that's the premise, and this is the conclusion, then you'd say this is a reason marker. You'd annotate it as RM, reason marker. Or you could say argument marker AM, maybe dash P. That's okay with me too. I'd be able to understand what's happening. This is a reason marker or a premise marker because... Uh, what follows it is supposed to be a premise. Whereas when you say blah, 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 therefore, blah, 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 this is going to be a conclusion marker, CM, or you could go AMC drawing letters. Ugh, gross. Sorry. Oh, oops, I screwed that up. You could say argument marker conclusion. One of these annotations is what I'd prefer. Um, this is a conclusion marker because when I say blah, 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 therefore, blah, 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 this thing that follows the therefore is going to be the conclusion. You can um, think about this with all the other argument markers. So there's a bunch more that the book gives you. I've got some more here in my lecture notes like hence, thus, then, um, because, for, as. Uh, these in the, in the right context can be argument markers. But you want to be listening for the support relation. Is the speaker advancing a claim on the basis of some other claims. That's the key. Is there a conclusion? Is there a claim that's receiving support? And are there premises? Are there claims that are providing support? So those claims are in this kind of support relation. That's what you want to listen for. Once you got that, figure out what's the language that kind of lets me know this. What's the thing that, what's the language that's used to link those claims together? And then is what follows that the premise or the conclusion? And as long as you know that, you know how to label that marker, whether it's a reason or a conclusion marker. So there's nothing more about like, like I was saying, students, when they're doing this in the past, I've seen students be like, well, the therefore, is that referencing this thing or this thing, the thing that comes forward or the thing that comes after? Uh, you don't have to play that kind of guessing game. It's always whatever follows after that will determine its category as being a conclusion marker or a premise marker. That's it. Uh, nothing more to that. Okay, um, also, we don't just have these single words. We've also got some phrases that could do this work. Um, and when you're doing these annotations, it's fine to uh, circle a whole group of words in order to, that you're like, these are the words that are doing this work. Um, the one thing I will warn is that I, another thing I also am used to seeing with students doing the homework here is that they'll circle the entire sentence and label that. And that's that's not going to that's not going to fly because there are specific words there is specific language that we use to make these maneuvers happen. Now I'm asking you for the detection to just listen for the phenomenon and then go looking for the words. But I am asking you to go look for the words too. What are the words? Try to figure out like what are the words that are responsible for alerting me to the fact that this thing is happening. So with argument markers, what's the phenomenon that we're listening for? We're listening for support relations. We're listening for whether someone advances a claim on the basis of something else. There's a lot of things that sound like arguments to us or that might look like arguments to us that are not arguments. And I want to talk about that right now. Um, one big one is when people make forceful claims or controversial claims. That doesn't mean that what they're doing is arguing. So like if someone starts making 
claims about their opinions about what's happening in politics right now, that doesn't mean that they're arguing. They might just be giving you a list of all the beliefs that they have, and that's it. It's only if they advance those claims on the basis of some other claims that, boom, now we have an argument on our hands. So, uh, an argue, and also we tend to use the word argument to refer to two people clashing with their opinions in a discussion. That's not the way we're going to be using the word here. Uh, we're not going to be using argument in any way to denotate a fight. When we talk about an argument, when someone is arguing, we just mean that they're constructing an argument, nothing more. Okay. Another thing that can look like an argument that isn't an argument that we can sometimes um, confuse as an argument is um, providing examples. Sometimes examples might be used as evidence, like because this example case was true, therefore maybe some generalized statement is true. So you're using an anecdotal case as your evidence for something. But um, I'd say more often we don't use um, anecdotes or illustrate uh, or examples as argumentative as providing argumentative support for some claim instead what we're using them for is illustrative purposes we're just trying to explain the claim that was made so when I'm like this is what's going on with something in the lecture and then like for example blah 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 and then I give the example sorry I just had a major sneeze attack which I just wanted to save you from so thank goodness I got to the pause button in time that was that was, uh, that was a little nuts um, so um, when I'm talking in the lecture, sorry for the interruption, when I'm talking in the lecture and I'm explaining maybe some concept or principle and then I give examples, for example, like it works like this, like um, conclusion markers are cases where the thing that follows the conclusion marker is the conclusion of an argument and the conclusion marker lets you know that there's a support relation happening. For example, the word therefore is a conclusion marker because when I use that, let, so, and then I start explaining the example. The example there doesn't prove that the original claim was right. It's not providing any support or evidence. All it's doing is helping the audience understand what the original claim was was um, saying. That's it. Sometimes, um, when even if people are having conversations about very controversial things, they might try to bring up an example to just help the other person who doesn't normally empathize with their position try to empathize with their position to see things from their point of view. They're like, for example, I would look at this case and I would interpret it or judge it this way. And like that's how that's how my thinking would work. That example doesn't prove anything. It's totally connected with just the original perspective. The original perspective is wrong, so will be the example. But what it does do is maybe help the audience understand what the original claim was. So you always gotta watch out for that. Examples, um, you, you kind of need to ask, maybe it, maybe it might not be clear. It might take some conversational implication analysis using Gricey maxims to figure it out. But you, because it, it might be an intended effect of speaking instead of an explicit one. Like if I say, this is true because of this case. Now that's, that's an explicit argument right there. I use because, it's an explicit argument marker. There's no question about what's taking place. Boom, done, end of story. And if I say something like, um, here's a claim, for example, all I mean by this is blah, 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 then using those phrases, for example, all I mean by this, sort of makes it clear that all I'm doing is using the case as an illustrative example. And that would all be explicit. But sometimes we're just like, claim, principled claim, example. And we don't use that more special language to let people know what's going on. Then you might have to interpret it and be like, okay, what is the speaker trying to do? Are they trying to use that example case as support for that claim that they're making? Or do I think all it was meant to do was just help to explain the idea? You'll have to make that judgment call about whether you're going to maybe see there being a support relation here, whether there's an argument taking place. The other thing that makes things tricky is that we don't always use the explicit words and phrases that English provides for us to let us know that we're arguing. But there could still be arguing taking place. So you don't want to wait until you see an argument marker to, to pick up on the fact that there's arguing happening. A lot of times, instead of saying like, blah, 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 therefore, blah, 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 we're just like, blah, 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 bl
And it's like we just have to pick up on maybe tone of voice or because of the logic of the claims that are being made or other types of conversational implication that what the person is doing is using some of these claims as support for another claim. But it might not be explicit. And we're going to have to listen for that too. I'm not going to there, – there's nothing to annotate for when the person doesn't use argument markers. But you'll still need to listen to it in preparation for the next module we'll be doing when we're going to be doing a little bit more the, what I call extended argumentative reconstruction where we'll get a passage of prose and we'll have to figure out what are the premises and the conclusion and there's a lot more interpretive work there. You're going to do a little bit of that in this unit uh, in the homework. There is there is an exercise that asks you to identify what's the conclusion of this argument and what are the premises but they're all going to be really simple cases right now with explicit argument markers that make it all easy. After we do the easy stuff, then the next unit we're, it's going to get a little fuzzier. It'll get a little gray and we'll have to make more judgment calls. Um, but I just want to alert that to you now. Right now, we're just going to stick to what's explicit, but in a little bit, it's going to get different. So it'll get fuzzy. It'll get, you have to make more judgment calls and do some more interpretation. Another thing that the Chapter 2 language material is going to help prepare us for. Another way that it all comes together. I love that about this class. There's a lot of interconnections. Okay. So keep in mind, we can make arguments without using explicit argument markers. But we do want to keep track of whether there are explicit argument markers because they make our life so much easier when we get to this activity we'll be doing in the next module of reconstructing people's arguments. If someone's making it very explicit, every maneuver they're making in the debate, that's great. That's going to really aid comprehension. Now, we don't do that. We use a lot of implication to communicate, and we're not always direct and robotic about everything that we're doing. And so we need to be able to pick up on that, too, to be good critical reasoners. Um, so that'll, that'll also be a part of the game. But for now, we're keeping it simple. Okay, so I talked about how just because people are making controversial claims doesn't mean they're necessarily making arguments. When people bring up examples, they are sometimes using those examples to make arguments, to provide support. But other times it's just an illustration, and then it's not an argument. The next thing we have to talk about are conditional claims. So let's go back to my lecture here. This is another thing that um, fools a lot of people. Uh, a lot of times we think that conditional claims are arguments, and they're not. But there's some reasons why we're fooled and why we're confused, and that's and why that's totally natural. I don't know if um, you maybe have heard of gambler's fallacy. I always like to to bring this up as an example. There's there's this thing, gambler's fallacy. It's a uh, it's something that um, much psychological research shows that we all naturally are prone to make this mistake in evaluating probability and it takes specific training to kind of weed out of us but the basic idea of, of gambler's fallacy is that let's say I'm, I'm uh, on a slot machine in a casino and I've been at the slot machine for five hours and it hasn't won I might reason that it's due to win like its chances, the chances of me winning if I stay at this slot machine go up the longer that I don't get a winner from that slot machine. Or if I roll a dice and 20 times and I don't know, 10 times it turns out to be a 1, just what happens, um, I might roll it again and be like, mm, chances are lower than 1 in 6 that it's going to be a 1 because we already got all these 1s. you got to have an equal distribution of, probabil of the probable outcomes of the possible outcomes. And but that's not how probability works. Every time I pull that crank on that slot machine and every time I roll the dice, the probability for what will happen is exactly the same. Exactly the same. But we don't reason that way intuitively about probability. We think the thing is due to happen or to not happen because it's already happened so much. Um, but uh, that's our mistake. And it's a classic psychological mistake that we make in reasoning. And it's pretty ingrained in our intuition. And you kind of need to take some probability classes or math to, to kind of wean that out. And the same thing is true with a lot of stuff in our logical thinking. And um, we're going to be doing a little more formal analysis. Um, we'll be doing a crash course in formal logic later in the quarter. Um, so not, And not for a little while. Not until we're done with the first exam. And we will talk about conditionals in much more depth there. But I want to start talking about them now um, because it's relevant for trying to figure out when an argument ha is happening and when it isn't. What is a conditional, you may be asking? A conditional is any claim that has this hypothetical basis. If something, then something else. It's not saying that thing will happen. It's just to say, if that happens, 
then this other thing will happen. That's a conditional claim. There's actually quite a variety of conditionals that are out there, and um, as maybe more evidence that our thinking about conditionals is um, confused, it, even philosophers who are working really hard at this and logicians who are trying to understand these things and their semantic properties uh, are not in agreement about how to understand conditionals. Last year I was reading a whole book just titled Conditionals, and it's like the survey of all the literature in by logicians about how to understand what's happening with conditionals. There's some conditionals there's a lot of agreement on in, to the point that it's like totally not controversial what's happening. But then there are other ways that we use conditionals in our thinking and in our language that are trickier. Um, and so we'll talk about that. But um, the one thing that is definitely true of all conditionals is that taken literally, none of them are arguments. So let's go back to my little whiteboard here. I'm going to... I'm going to erase all this. Okay, I might might leave this. Yeah, let's leave that. So let's say, let's go back. Ah, oh, I should have I shouldn't erase it all. Okay, let's say I do blah blah blah, blah blah blah. So, and then here's another example. Some blah blah blahs going on. So if I say blah blah blah, therefore, and in another case I say so these are like. You know, it's like a quotation. There we go. I say, if blah, 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 then blah, blah, blah. Um, and let's call, let's give these uh, just little letters to refer to them. Let's call this the A part, the A part, and the B part over here. When I tell you A, therefore B, I'm making an argument, if we're going to use the standard form sort of thing, I'm saying A is true. And because A is true, that provides support for therefore thinking that B is true. And when I make an argument, I'm advancing both of these claims. I'm saying B is a true claim. Why? Because A is a true claim. So when I'm arguing, I'm making multiple claims, I'm making multiple truth claims, and then I'm also saying that they're in this special kind of support relation, that they're in a rational relationship where the truth of this speaks to the truth of this. It justifies believing that this is true. That's what's happening with an argument when I say A, therefore B. So let's say this down here is an, oh my gosh. So this first example we would think of like this. But when we're looking at if A, then B, we're not making this kind of, we're not doing the same thing that we're doing when we're making an argument. If I tell you, let, let's work with an, a particular example now, it's as an illustration, <laughs> going back to our talk of examples. Um, uh, and this one, I, I don't know, I, maybe I should think of a better one than this, but this one keeps um, coming back as just like a really pointed one to capture the logical force of what's happening. So what if I told you, uh, what if I made this claim? If you cut my head off, then I will die. Um, which is a true claim. It's true that if you cut my head off, I will die. Um, it's true if you cut Highlander's head off, he'll die. Um, I don't know if the Highlander reference goes anywhere. I like to use Highlander sometimes to describe this logic stuff, but um, I can't check. Is it online? I don't know. Highlander means anything to you. Um, so uh, that is a true claim. But notice, it's true of me right now. It's true that if you cut my head off, I would die. But it's not true that my head is cut off. It is very firmly attached to my body, and I'm obviously alive. I wouldn't be able to give this video lecture if I was dead. Um, so the claim, let's go back to this here, this claim, this whole claim, gosh, let me, I can draw that better. This whole claim right here is a true claim. It is true. Even though this part right here is technically false, is not true, um, and the second part is likewise false. Now, if I gave you an argument, and the claim that is your conclusion is a false claim, and the claim that you're providing as evidence for that claim is also a false claim, you'd be like, that's a terrible argument. Okay? 
But that's the thing about conditional statements. They're not arguments. They're just single claims. They're claims that can be true or false, um, but they aren't arguments. There's not a support relationship between these two things. I think part of what's going on here is that conditional claims are complex claims. They're, they're, you're making a, it's kind of like a conjunction, junction, what's your function? You make complex sentences out of simple sentences with words like and. You're making a complex claim here out of two smaller claim components, Tim's head being cut off and Tim dying. And you make a more complicated claim by putting that with if that, then this other thing. Okay, so that's going on. So there's, there is a logical relationship that is being established between these two states of affairs when you make the conditional claim. It's just not the relationship of support that's happening in an argument. And that's the relationship between the premise and the conclusion. That's, the, that's a, maybe a more detailed way of saying the, that conditionals are not arguments, but that's the key to it. In order to have an argument, you need multiple claims that are in a support relation, but a conditional is just a single claim. It cannot, it doesn't, it actually is not making multiple claims. And it's got some of these strange properties to it. Again, we'll, we'll go into conditionals in much more depth later in the course, but that's a big thing to watch out for. Lots of students want to put um, if and then as argument markers, and they are not. So watch out for that. This will be on the exam. I'm, I'm being fair here, warning you about it. It will be on the exam. Um, conditionals are not arguments. If you hear someone making a claim, and it's got that hypothetical relationship. Even if they, they can, we can express conditionals without using language like if then. There's other ways to do it. But what makes a conditional a conditional is that it's a, establishing a connection between two hypothetical states of affairs. So if you hear that happen, if the person is like, were this to happen or were this not to happen, then um, there would be that would be a, a conditional you got, and it is not an argument. But here's one final point about conditionals. Even though a conditional in isolation is not an argument, and words like if and then are not argument markers, inasmuch as conditionals are claims, they are truth claims, they can be true or false. Like, um, uh, this is where I like to bring in the Highlander thing. I'm not going to do that, though. Um, it, it, it's a true thing that if you cut my head off, I will die. But it'd be a false claim to say, if you cut my finger off, I will die. Right? That's a, that's a, someone said that, oh, got to be careful about your fingers because if your fingers get cut off then you'll die like maybe a kid misheard someone talking about decapitation and misinterpreted it as the removal of fingers or something like that that kid is walking around with a false belief when they make that claim they're making a false claim okay because that those there isn't that connection that the child is saying between those two states of affairs the child is saying that you know this would be connected with this the truth of this would be connected with that but that's not actually the case. So um, conditionals are claims. They are saying something about how the world works and how these circumstances might be linked together. And they can be true or false. And in as much as they are claims, the point here is that conditionals can be a part of an argument, even though they are not arguments by themselves. So going back to our little diagram here, if an argument is just a claim supported by at least one other claim, like a conclusion supported by at least one premise, you could have conditionals as conclusions or conditionals as premises. Uh, here's a really silly argument. Um, oh, no, I can't do it that way. That would be obviously bad. Um, well, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, let's do this. So um, if, um, uh, okay, so may, let me, let me, let's do a different conditional here. How about, um, how about this conditional? Premise one. Um, if I get this video lecture done in time, then I will watch the Cubs game. Second premise. I'm getting this video lecture done in time. Conclusion. I will watch the Cubs game. That's a very simple argument. Um, it's a pretty good argument. It's uh, It's got a good support relation. If the premises are true, the conclusion is going to have to be true. Um, so that's cool. That's, a, that's one of the things we care about for a good argument. And the premises... Those are true. I think they're. I'm looking at the clock. Yeah, I think that those are going to be true. Um, maybe maybe some things could be disputable. Maybe I'll end up talking for another two hours to you. No, I'm not going to do that because, like I said, I was going to break these things up. Um, so maybe that's a good argument, and it includes a conditional. If I get the video lecture done in time, then I'll watch the Cubs game. Um, that's that conditional is still a claim, and it can play a role in an argument as some of the evidence to support the conclusion. 
It also might be the kind of thing that I want as a conclusion. Conditionals are the kinds of claims that science trades a lot in. Um, a lot of scientific laws are conditionals. If this, then this is what's going to happen. Like causal relationships can be captured in this conditional um, logic form of, of claims. And scientists have evidence to back up that if this happens, then this other thing will happen. Um, so that they can be conclusions too. They can receive support. We can be like, oh yeah, there is a connection between those states of affairs. Why? Because I've had experience and it's shown me that. That could be your evidence, you know. So you could, they can be a part of arguments, but they're not arguments all by themselves. Okay, when we get to this next part of the lecture, um, we'll start talking um, a little bit more about how we evaluate arguments as a way of helping to understand a little bit more about how they function. We're not going to be really getting into the task of trying to tell whether arguments are good or bad yet, but in listening to arguments to follow them, we do need to have some idea of what's going on with that um, to know what to listen for. So that'll be for next time. See ya!